<laughs> and that's, that's what I get to start with. Um, I was thinking about wearing my leotards for you guys today and then didn't want to ruin it. Uh, we, we have amazing artists, designers at our church. They make lots of great videos and graphics. And we said, hey guys, on Father's Day, we're gonna start a new series and we wanna call it Gains and it's gonna be awesome. So like we need a video before the sermon that's like high octane and like kind of broed out and you know, like a lot of testosterone. And then that is what they made for us <laughs> this week. Uh, but hey, we, uh, if you're new, my name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors around here. And we're glad you're with us as we kick off this new teaching series. If you're new to church or new to us, what we do in a series is basically we talk about something for a couple of weeks, then we get bored and we talk about something different. So we're starting a new series. So it's a great first time if you're here and hopefully you'll be here every week as we talk about how to make some gains in our lives, and I'm not talking about your bench press, we're not talking about your bank account, we are talking about how to live the best kind of life. How do you get the most out of life? How do you live the kind of life you were created to live, whether you follow Jesus or not? We all want to live that kind of a life. But Jesus said, I came to give you life to the full, like the fullness of life. There is a fullness of life that none of us have fully ever experienced, but we all chase for it. We all want it. The kind of life, what we wish Jesus had said is, hey, I came to give you life and you'll follow me and it'll get super easy and you'll have just happily ever afters and you'll have no more pain in your life. He didn't say that. What he said was, follow me and you will have life to the full, which means through the ups and the downs, the peaks, the valleys, the really good times and the victories and the really bad times and the hard things we endure in this life, you will find a fullness of who I am and who you are in relationship with me. You will grow to become the man or the woman that I created you to be. It's the best kind of life, but in order for you and I to live that kind of life, we have a lot of next steps to take, or you could say we have a lot of gains to make in our relationship with God. The truth is, though, we all get really busy and very easily distracted and sometimes just flat out lazy. And the truth of how to make the best gains in your life is, is far more simple. You actually probably already know it. You could, we'll call it spiritual disciplines. And this is actually what we wanna focus in on for the next couple of weeks is talk about these spiritual disciplines, these daily simple practices given to you and I to, to maximize our gains as we follow God that you and I would be strengthened and matured and sharpened constantly as we grow in our faith journey. And spiritual disciplines mean... I mean, exactly what they say. Sometimes it's a discipline. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes you don't want to do it, but you need to. And you find through these processes, uh, spiritual disciplines are really simple. They're things like prayer, right? Many of us, we, we believe in prayer. It's a great thing. We even tell people, hey, I'm praying for you, even though we probably don't. We just say it. Prayer is a discipline, a chosen practice of a way as we follow God to begin our day, fill our day, end our day in communion, in relationship with the one who created us. Spiritual disciplines are things like reading scripture, it claims to be the very word of God for us. And daily, it's the most formative spiritual discipline that you and I daily would come to that text, read it, let it read us, and be a lamp that guides us in this life. But many of us, while we believe in it, we rarely actually read it. Some of us, the only time we've engaged with scripture is right now, today at church, when someone's gonna read it to you. And the, the Bible invites all of us to wrestle with it, uh, come to it. I mean, it raises all kinds of tensions and questions, and it's supposed to, as we pray, as we read Scripture, there's simple daily disciplines that will help you grow in so many ways that you can't even totally measure. There, there are spiritual disciplines like fasting. When was the last time you fasted, not because a doctor told you to for some procedure the next day? Have you ever fasted? Hey, this is, if you're new to church, is a, is a spiritual discipline where you choose to for one day or two or a couple of days, some people as many 40 days, which is crazy, n to choose not to eat any food and instead spend the time that they would be preparing food and eating food, praying and reading the Bible as this physical demonstration of saying, God, through the hunger that I feel physically, I'm reminded of how I depend upon you, and not just food. I depend upon you and your word to guide me. And Jesus, this is funny, when Jesus talked about fasting and gave us instructions, he said, when you fast, do these things. He didn't say, if you like it, if you ever want to, hey, you should, you know, maybe if you're having a good day, try it. Like, he just said, when you, like, the assumption is you do it, and yet many of us maybe have never done it. In fact, this past term in our small groups, 
my group was going through this uh, content, this book called Rooted, and it forces you to practice some of these things. And most of the people in my group, probably only one of them, hasn't been following Jesus or in church for at least 15 or more years. Like these people have been around church, the Bible, Jesus, for a really long time. Well, one of the days, one of the practices, we all fasted for the entire day, then we came together as a small group that night to pray, and then we broke the fast and we ate pizza and we felt terrible, so don't do it that way. But it was awesome because what happened, with here are all these people who've been in church forever, they had never in their life, not one day, not one meal, fasted and focused on prayer. And what God did, how he showed up, how they heard from him, it was awesome because they just disciplined themselves to try this thing that the Bible invites us to do. So I don't know what these will all look like, but we're gonna talk about them for the next couple of weeks for you. And it's basically a way to just kind of flip pain around and see it differently, to, to, to recognize that like life is hard and there are things that we must submit ourselves to. There's things we have to sacrifice uh, and, and trust that gains will come through those things if you and I will just choose to put them into practice. So what we're gonna do to start this series off is we're gonna open up to a book in the Bible called Hebrews. So if you have a Bible, open up to Hebrews chapter 12. We're gonna start in verse one. And it's not really actually a book. It was a letter written to followers of Christ in the first century world as they were trying to figure out how to follow God in a culture that was not. And it has a bunch of things that it's gonna say to you and I to challenge us to kind of see life and the struggles of life differently. In fact, to see pain as discipline and that we can choose discipline in our life and that it will grow us. That, that the kind of the biggest gains you and I can make will be through choosing discipline through, like think of the word perseverance. That you and I in life, as we face the stuff that we face, we can choose to be steadfast even when stuff is difficult, that we can stay faithful and committed and taking next steps even when success or achieving it is delayed. And we're invited to grow through that kind of a process. And the truth is, we all know this, but we hate it. All good things come through hard work. There's nothing really awesome in our life that we will ever achieve or acquire or have or do or become that is easy. All good things come through hard work. We don't like that, but it's just true. Think about this for all you men. You wanna be a great dad? You wanna be a great man for your wife? It will not happen because you just choose to be. It will not happen because you'll just wake up tomorrow and happen to have become one. It will only have happened because you chose to do the daily work that it takes to become that man for those people God has put in your life. It's just true. And so you and I have to choose to put in that work, and we're all guilty of this. A lot of times when we think we kind of miss this big point. When we think of like the goals, the dreams for our life, what we want to do or who we want to become, oftentimes we think of those things. Those are things that other people can see and celebrate in our life. But the only way you and I will ever achieve that or become those things is through a multitude of unseen little disciplines in our life that no one will ever see, no one will ever celebrate. No one's ever going to go, hey, great job reading the Bible consistently. They won't even know that you did that. There are so many little disciplines and daily choices that are the building blocks, they're the foundation for all the good things we hope to have, acquire, and become in our life. And we're too often guilty of underestimating the unseen things in our life. In fact, there's a book written called Anonymous. It was written by a lady named Alicia Britt Choley, and she said it this way. It is critical that we not mistake unseen for unimportant. I think for, for you women, if you wanna be a great mom or you wanna be a great boss or a great employee or a great follower of Christ, it won't be because uh, you just choose to be. It'll be because you put in the work to become that and it'll be in choosing to discipline yourself on the simple little things that are totally unseen that no one else will celebrate. You wanna be a great student or a great athlete or a great follower of Christ, it all takes work. In fact, Andy Stanley, he's one of my favorite teaching pastors, he's a brilliant guy, and he said this, and I love this quote, he said, your intentions will not determine your destination in life. Your disciplines will. See, we all have the best of intentions. We intend to be a good person and intend to change that, and we intend to not do that habit in the future, and we intend to be more forgiving. We intend to be awesome. Our intentions will never get us there. It's the disciplines that will determine the destinations in our life. It's the work that we choose to put in. And so as we look to this text in Hebrew chapter 12, we'll start in verse one, we'll read a handful of these verses. It's gonna give us three kind of analogies to understand how to make the greatest gains in our journey, in our pursuit of who Christ is, in our faith journey. But, but all of it could really be summarized in this one simple principle. 
You've heard this principle before. It's so simple, you almost want to ignore it, but it is profound and it applies to every area of your life. In fact, the, the text that we're gonna read today won't, won't directly say it, it'll allude to this principle. But the Apostle Paul, he would teach it directly numerous times. Jesus would say it directly. In fact, the Bible echoes this principle some 70 plus times throughout the whole of Scripture. It is so profound, yet so simple. And here it is. You will reap what you sow in this life. Simple. Do you want to have a great marriage? You're going to reap what you sow, which means the work you put in is what you can expect to get out. You don't plant wheat in a field expecting apple trees. That would be stupid. And yet many of us aren't putting work into the marriages. We're just complaining about them. We want them to change and this to happen. What you are sowing is nothing. What you will reap is nothing. If all you sow is bitterness and anger and criticism or sarcasm, you will reap that. You wanna have a great marriage? Sow into it what you want out of it. Be a person of forgiveness. Practice conflict resolution. Practice mutual submission. Serve that person that God's placed in your life. You reap what you sow. It applies to every area of your life. You wanna grow in your relationship with God? You wanna grow in your relationship with your kids? You wanna be the kind of person God's calling you to be? Simple. You reap what you sow in this life, which means you and I have to do the work if we expect great things to come out of it. Now, this is interesting. As we turn to, to verse one, the, the opening word of verse one in Hebrews 12 is really important. The word is therefore. And it's like a cheesy church thing they say. When you're reading the Bible and you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what's it there for? But it's really true. Because it's there as this huge connection of everything that was just discussed because of what was said, now do these things. So before we read these things, we have to understand what the author was just saying in chapter 11 of Hebrews. It's an incredible chapter, and they call it the Hall of Faith. It's like the Hall of Fame of the people of God. It's the who's who of people who were found faithful and righteous and got to be a part of changing history, not because of what they didn't do, but because of what they did do, because of the work that they did. So you gotta read it if you haven't read it or haven't read it in a while. It doesn't say Noah was found righteous because he didn't watch rated R movies. It says he was found righteous because he did the very things that God invited him to do and called him to do. He did the work. And so with all those people, those like incredible stories of people's faith and the things that they did, verse one begins like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, like we stand on the shoulders of spiritual giants. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition for sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. See, in all the things that we go through and the struggles we have, the author is saying, if we keep our focus on who Jesus is, everything we go through pales in comparison. In fact, you can hear echoing the very words of Jesus when he said, hey, in life you will face many trials, but take heart, for I have overcome. Focus on me. See life differently. So kind of the first analogy that we're given here to understand this life that we're in and how to make great gains is to choose to see yourself and the life you're living as an enduring athlete. You're not just an athlete. You're one enduring the training. You're the one paying the price, earning the right to run the race that's been marked out for you. You are an athlete, at least in this regard. You might not feel like an athlete. You might not even look like an athlete, but you are one. And so it's kind of like the question Hebrews 12 is asking you and I is, how's the race going? God has set the course of a race, which means you can't run your own race. You got to run his race. How's the race going? How's your pace? How's your attitude? How's your energy levels? Are you cramping? Are you tripping and falling a lot? Are you laying on the ground giving up? Are you spending too much time at the Gatorade stations along the way of the race? Like, how's it going? And how can you be more intentional seeing that you're not just an athlete, you're one enduring the training, knowing and trusting on the other side of it, God is growing you through that process. God's calling all of us to enforce some simple little disciplines in our life and to throw off the things that hinder us and distract us and, and to uh, start working on getting rid of some of the sins in our life, the things that we know don't honor God and they so easily entangle us. And I love that the author separates those two things. The things that hinder us and the sins that entangle us are not always the same things. 
right? The stuff that hinders and distracts us, it's not always a bad thing. Sometimes they're quite good things. There's just too much of them or, or like they're just not the best things for us to be spending our time on. Think of this. How many of us spend an insane amount of time trying to get high scores on really stupid games on our phone? Like if you could calculate the amount of time you've spent doing that, that is the exact kind of thing you will not grow old and sit down with your grandkids and be like, man, in my day, grandpa was killing it on Temple Run. No one will care. <laughs> no one even plays Temple Run anymore, right? And some of us, we spend so much time trying to watch every episode of certain shows. Our grandkids won't care about that. That's not changing the world. Some of us, we spend way too much time trying to keep up with everybody's life on social media. Or we get, spend way too much time trying to have our kids play every sport or give them every experience. They're not bad things. They're just a distraction from the best things that God wants us focusing on. So if you see yourself as an athlete in this life, what are the things that are hindering you and slowing you down and getting in the way and distracting you from the race that God has set before you? What is that? And, and the sins and the things that get in your way and, just, and you know, mess you up. You know, the problem for many of us is we're so good at self-deception. We can justify anything. I mean, all of us have blind spots. And blind spots are so tough to deal with because they're exactly that. We're completely blind to them. They're the kind of thing that when someone suggests it to us, we immediately want to downplay it or reject it or justify it. Just two weeks ago, Dave Dumman, our senior pastor, he's my boss. I was sitting down talking with him and I said, hey, what is a blind spot in my life? And you know what he said? He said, Kevin, you know, you just work too hard. You're too disciplined. Just kidding. He didn't say that. <laughs> what he did say, I didn't like. You know why I didn't like it? It's because it's a blind spot in my life. What if this week you asked your spouse or asked your best friend or asked someone close to you in your life who knows you, loves you, and will tell you the truth, what is a blind spot in my life I need to work on? What is something that is hindering me and holding me back from becoming who God intends me to be? And what I love in this, this text, if you're a follower of Jesus, the author of Hebrews is asking you and I this question. He's saying that the most important question you and I can answer today is are you godly? Are you becoming like the pioneer and the perfecter of your faith? Are you godly? Not are you nice, not are you well-intended, not are you consistent in attending church, not any of those things. Are you godly? What's getting in the way of you running the race and becoming who God is calling you to be? And if you're not a follower of Christ, there's this incredible claim from Scripture the gospel, the teachings of Jesus contend that found in the person of who Jesus is and your belief of what he accomplished and following his teachings is the answer to every question that you have ever searched for. I know that's a bold claim, but that's the claim that he makes as the author of your life. And he invites you to pray, to talk to him, to wrestle with your doubts and your questions. Ask him to show himself as real to you. All right, next analogy. So you and I, we're like an enduring athlete, but here's the next one as we understand how we relate to God in this race that we have. Starting in verse five, it says, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his sons? And this is important. The author is pointing back to a well-known proverb. So everyone knows this. And he's like, have you forgotten this? And as it references sons, this is so important to know. In that first world culture, sons, specifically the firstborn son, was the one who had access to dad and full rights to all of the inheritance. And so this isn't about like, well, if you're a woman, sorry, us guys get it all. That's not what it's being said. This is so important. What it's saying is that in adoption into the kingdom of God, all of us get access like sons. We all get to be like the firstborn sons, meaning we have access to the father, keys to the kingdom, and we get the rights to the inheritance, every one of us. So here's, here's where it goes. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he uh, chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. This is a choice. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you were not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us as we re and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our own good in order that we may share in his holiness, that we may become more 
godly like him. So if we're gonna make great gains in this life as we follow, we have to see ourselves as an athlete enduring the training to become something better than we are today. And the second is that we begin to understand who God is. He's like an exhorting father, a a loving, heavenly, exhorting father standing there urging you and I to become something, challenging us to change some things, inviting us to take some next steps like any loving father would. Right, remember the principle is simple. You reap what you sow in life. Great gains come from investing in good things. Part of that is doing the work And part of that is also removing the harmful things that are in the way of you becoming who God wants you to be. Which means God is also interested in helping you sin less. And like any dad, he will train you and rebuke you and discipline you to help you become the person that you need to learn, the lessons that you need to learn so that you can become someone who not only sins less but that your character grows. And God is not interested, he's not like some judge upholding the law and punishing us. He is a heavenly father who is trying to train us through discipline, right? It's, it's some, you've, you've had those moments, like you know you can't discipline other people's kids, but we think about it sometimes, right? You've had that moment, maybe at dinner last night, you're like, I'm gonna, on behalf of your parents, I'm gonna teach you something. You can't do that, you'll go to jail. Because that's not your kid. But those who are your kid, you have a responsibility to train them, to discipline them, and that's what the author's saying. God is just like that. His love and his grace include discipline. That's not our favorite part of God but it is absolutely a part of his grace and his love. That he loves you and I enough to correct our course when we're off track. He's full of grace and the Bible goes out of its way to explain that he does not take pleasure in disciplining us and sometimes there's a really fuzzy area of of faith in this that sometimes people are like, oh, I got cancer, God's punishing me. That's not how it works. Sometimes you and I, we go through consequences because of our own stupidity. Sometimes we have to play out the natural consequences of the own mistakes or sins that we've made. Other times, we have to deal with the consequences of other people's sins and mistakes that affect us. Sometimes, we just live in a very broken world, and other times, God's trying to teach us stuff, but no matter what it is that we go through, the Bible is saying right here and claiming you and I can choose to endure hardship as discipline, which means we can see it as something that's gonna make us better. And so when we're going through stuff that's tough, instead of asking, why me, or where are you at, God, it's learning to say, no, God, God, I trust you're gonna make me better through this. Even if I really don't like it or I really don't wanna go through it. Because it's not just him disciplining us, it's also him wanting to strengthen our character. Right, in verse 10, it said that he disciplines us for our good. That that he knows where he's trying to take you and so he knows the kind of strength and conditioning we need to go through to become that person. In fact, think about this. Think back in your life to a season that's behind you, you've passed it, but think about a season in your life where you grew the most as a person. When was that? Why was that? What what was it about that season of life that you grew so much, that that you just changed, you matured? What, What was happening? Was it not probably also one of the hardest things you've ever gone through? Like when you look back, that was the hardest thing you ever went through. And on the other side of it, you're like, man, I've learned so much about who God is. I learned so much about who I am or who I am not. Isn't that interesting? Like it's inconvenient, but it's interesting that that some of the hardest things we go through in life go hand in hand with some of the the times and seasons of our life where we learn the most and grow the most. That that in the midst of, of the most need that we ever had, we learned the most that we ever did. Times in our life where we learned that that, that on the other side of pain can become strength, that, that we can move past, you know, face our fears and move beyond our comfort zones. Like those are hard things to learn in life. We don't like them and yet they reap incredible benefits in our life. You know, my wife and I, we try to teach this to our kids and we do it in a number of ways, but one of them was years ago, her and I were at a marriage conference and the, the speaker said something that just struck me. I'd never thought of this. He said, how do you know in our country in America when you're a man? He goes, in our country, we have no milestones or no gateways to manhood. In most other cultures, and especially through human history, there was some stuff to accomplish, some things, and then like one day, like you were a boy, and now you're a man. And that's how culture views you, and there's a responsibility with that. And he goes, in America, what is that? And I was like, I've never thought of that. How do any of us guys know if we're a man or not? Are you a man because you shave? No, plenty of boys shave. Are you a man because you have a job and you drive a car? Nope, we know plenty of boys that do those things too. What makes you 
a man. So my wife and I, we have three sons. If you have daughters, I can't help you, but we have three sons. And we decided in light of that to go, let's every year uh, come up with milestones to manhood and help teach them these very same things that force them to move beyond their fears and their comfort zones and learn skills and stuff. And so what we've done is we've kind of timed this out in their life where every year on their birthday, they have a new task to accomplish. And then selfishly, they have a new set of movies that they're allowed to watch. And this has been a, a bit of a contention in my, my marriage with my wife because she's always afraid I'm gonna show them movies before they're ready. Who knows when your sons are ready to watch John Rambo? You just know they have to, right? So I don't know when, so we just like pick the time. So it's super awesome. And every year, they're, they're kind of fun stuff. Like you had to build a shelter and sleep in it one night. You had to open a bank account and learn savings. You had to start a business. My oldest is 13. And this summer, he has to plan and take his mother on a date. He has to uh, arrange childcare, which will be me. And he has to pay for dinner which will just be my money, but he has to learn how to treat a woman and go on a date. It'll be like this cool little moment for he and his mom, stuff like that. Well, the best one by far has been when you're nine. When you are nine years old, you have to go uh, to Cedar Point and ride every roller coaster in one day. And it is awesome. It is so awesome. So when I took my, my nine-year-old, or he was nine, he's 11 now, my middle son, I took him there. If you've ever met him, he's really cute, but he's super cocky. And so when we got to Cedar Point, he thinks, oh, I got this, this is no big deal. And I'm like, son, you don't understand. He's like, dad, I went to Disney World. I'm like, buddy, that's not this. This is a whole different world here. So, so cocky and thinks, I've got this. So he decides his first roller coaster is gonna be the Maverick. Have you ever been there? Super fun, super fast. So we go back there and we get in line and he's like, dad, I don't even wanna ride with you. And I was like, okay, well, that hurts because like, this is like our thing and all right, whatever. So he thinks he's got this. So he rides by himself. When we got back into the station, he's behind me. I turn around. We live in Michigan like you. My son is super pale. Zero colors left in his body. He looked like he had died. Like it was scared the life out of him. When we came off the thing through the little station that has the pictures, this is what my nine-year-old son looked like on the middle of the Maverick ride. That is called the fear of God on your face. And I was too cheap to buy the picture. I regret it since. But um, so my son comes off of this and he's like, dad, I'm not doing that again. And I was like, son, you are. Because in the safest way possible, dad wants to teach you that past your fears and past your comfort zones are some of the best experiences you will ever have in your life. And so naturally, I took him next to the Millennium Force because it's bigger and it's faster. <laughs> and as we are in line, <laughs> this is so, you're, some of you are gonna hate me. But anyway, as we're in line, the last 100 yards, li uh, 100 yards of the line, if you've been there, the last 100 yards as you're waiting in line, the train flies past you as it comes back into the station. And every time it would fly past his nine-year-old little heart, it would just start to beat faster and starting to well up inside of him. I do not want to do this, Dad. And when we got up to the front, we're about to get on the train. My nine-year-old son is turned towards me. He's crying and he's pushing me and he's saying, Dad, I'm not doing this. And there that day in front of all those Cedar Point employees and adults in the line, they saw me in a moment of parental genius force my nine-year-old son onto a roller coaster <laughs> and buckle him in. And say, yeah, I know, I, it would be child abuse if I kept doing it. But one more time, I thought, son, you just gotta trust me, this can be amazing when you realize you're not gonna die and that it can be a thrill in your life. And if you hate this one, we won't do it again. Tears and all, dad's next to you this time. And as we went up and we dropped in, it worked. He loved it. And he had a blast and I spent the rest of the day trying to keep up with him and my son for the rest of his life will remember that day when he realized that the other side of your fears are some amazing things to experience in life. And beyond the pain and the discomfort and some of the stuff you don't want to, if you trust dad and his guiding and leading in your life, our God is just the same way. There are some roller coasters you're gonna have to ride and you don't want to, but he promises to be right next to you. He promises to hold your hand. And he promises that through the ups and the downs and the fears, he will work all of it out as the author of your life to strengthen your character and grow you into the person that he created you to be. And the unfortunate truth to make gains in our journeys with Christ is we have to go through stuff that we don't want to, but we can choose to see hardship as discipline, as something that will make us better. So what is that for you? Where's there pain or tension or discontentment in your life. That today might be an opportunity to see it not as something you hate or loathe or lament, but rather as an opportunity for you to become better through. What does that look like? What's the habit or the hang up? Now here, here's the last analogy. So we have this, we're like an enduring athlete. God's like this exhorting father. And then here's how it wraps up when we read verses 11 and 12. And it almost feels like the author's making fun of us. Here's what it says. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, we all agree, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, 
Strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Do you even lift, bro? Like, that's what I feel like he's saying. (laughs) Strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Understand that discipline will strengthen you. You and I just have to choose to let it. We are an enduring athlete and God is an exhorting father, but it gives us this other analogy of farming. Like you and I are called to be an effective farmer with our life and that we will reap what we sow in this life. And if we allow the discipline, the hardships to train us, we will be made better for it. No one likes going through it. It's painful. But if we choose to trust God in the process, it produces a harvest of righteousness. It strengthens us. And like a farmer, you and I are called to work hard, get up early, have routines and habits and do the work. We can't cause the growth, only God can. But we have a responsibility to cultivate the soil, to plant the seeds, to pull the weeds, to do the work. And I don't know what that looks like in your life. I don't know what weeds you need to pull. I don't know what nutrients you need to add. I don't know what what you need to do, but I do know God is calling you to take ownership and cultivate your spiritual journey if you wanna take this this life to, to the full to live the kind of life that matters, the kind of life that will leave a legacy that will make this world a better place. Because God's not calling us just to make some gains or take some next steps. He's calling us to win at the race of life. To farm with some intentionality and cultivate the right kind of habits so that he can grow you and I and change us. And, And this is so important when we talk about this. God is not in love with the future you. He's not in love with the future you who finally gets your act together, who makes enough gains to earn his love. He is not in love with you when you're trying to be perfect. You're terrible at it. You can't be. He invites you and I instead to focus on the perfect one, the perfecter and the pioneer of our faith. In fact, in Romans, Apostle Paul tells us that God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still sinners, when we could never earn it or even know to ask for it, he demonstrated his love by dying for us while we were still sinners. His love has already been demonstrated, already been proven. His love for you is, you are loved. And it's out of this love that you are invited to take next steps and become the son and the daughter he created you to be. 